Hi, and welcome back to my channel, Quest for Faith with Brian. And today I have a special guest, Eddie Trask from Catholic Recon. And Eddie, I'm super excited to have you on. I was a guest on, on your channel a few weeks ago and uh, definitely really excited to talk with you again. And we had a great time uh, on through that conversation. And so thanks for coming on again. I, or for the first time. So yeah, yeah, Brian, my, my pleasure. Thank you so much for inviting me and thank you for sharing your testimony on my channel. It, it has impacted a lot of people. So I, I I'm humbled by that. I mean, you, you, it's interesting. And, and I always say this, uh, to anybody that, that has a story, um, you don't know to you, it's just your story but you have no idea how it's going to affect other people by telling it. And so I think it's really important for us as Catholics and as Christians to be open about our faith, our faith journey, and we can learn from each other. And so, um, yeah, I was, it was a pleasure uh, being on. I'm really grateful uh, how that video is doing for your channel, but more importantly, just the people it's impacting. Yes. Um, I, I, that's, yeah. that's phenomenal. Yeah. So yeah, uh, definitely. So tonight we're going to, kind of go through your, your journey, uh, growing, going, growing up. And so you were a cradle Catholic, correct? Yeah. Cradle okay. Catholic. Yeah. And so we can kind of go through that and then we're going to switch topics halfway through. So stay tuned. And we're going to be talking about commonalities of converts and what the common themes are that Eddie's Eddie's experienced on his channel. That he's been doing for three years, interviewing different people. Um, so it's definitely going to be a fun one tonight. So yeah, let's uh let's let's get started. So uh so you grew up where where'd you grow up anyways? I grew up in the Central Valley, California. So okay. small town of Kerman, which is outside of Fresno. Yeah, I was born in Fresno. That is, yeah, Fresno Hospital. Fresno Are County you, Hospital. Fresno County, okay. If you had said St. Agnes, which is where I was born, I would okay, that would have been crazy. That would have been crazy. Yeah, I had no my, idea. Wow. Yeah, my uh, aunt and uncle and grandparents live in Clovis, and then my parents and grandma live up in Oakhurst. Oh, okay, so, that's that's cool. Yeah, no wonder, yeah. No wonder we hit it off. So yeah, that's that's it, right? So yeah, yeah anyway. my family's old roots there in in that Madera County area. So there you go. Yeah. yeah. So awesome. where I grew up uh, as a cradle Catholic, the parish there. Uh, it's it's still there. They moved from the small. I mean, the, where I went to church, where I was an altar server, that was a parish that could probably house ninety people. Wow, very small. Yeah, very small. Yeah, I mean, if you have a population of five thousand, yeah, you're, you're not, and you yeah. have a massive Catholic church. Yeah, yeah, definitely. And and California is a weird state to me because. It was literally founded by the Catholic Church. You know, growing up in California, you learn about all the missions. And even for me as a kid, like I never connected it with the Catholic Church. I don't know why. Like they didn't talk about it as Catholic churches and missions. But that's like all California was founded with. The, the first settlers from Europe were all missionaries. They were all priests that were that were forming these missions. And it's kind of, it's sad to see there's not a, as strong as a Catholic faith as there should be compared to like the East coast, like Boston, New York, True. that type of stuff. True. Um, but yeah. Okay. So central California, I know exactly where you're at. I, I'm following you. Yep. So, um, as I mentioned, I was an altar server for nine, 10 years and was, I mean, the family was dedicated to, to the church, you know, but my dad, so he attended with, the family for the first, I mean, how old was I? Um, for the first 10 years of my life, but he was not Catholic at that point. So he got okay. married to my mom in the church. He was raised Lutheran and he had gone to a number of different Protestant churches over the years. And so he was accompanying the family and trying his best yeah. to lead the family through, through all those years. And I like to tell this part of the story. It's, I didn't even know this until less than 10 years ago when i was i think 10 or 11 my dad went to a yard sale and he found this book called story of a soul mm -hmm. Saints of Lisieux, yeah uh, autobiography and by the time he finished that book he, he was just mesmerized I, I i think that's what he said just he felt drawn to it 
finished reading it, said, that's it. I'm joining the Catholic that's church. That's awesome. Yeah. So he came into the church that kind of strengthened. I, I, I remember that period of time. It, it did strengthen the family. I felt more secure mm -hmm. attending the Catholic church. It's all I really knew, but it, there was something that happened when he came into the church. And so continued with altar serving was confirmed. And, you know, a lot of those years, you just say you're Catholic, but you don't, you don't know what that means. You're right. learning. You, I'm going to catechism. I'm learning certain things, not retaining much, to be honest with yeah, you. Yeah, you're just going through the motions. Going through you're the motions. Yeah. And then in high school, maybe the second half of high school, I started to feel, I don't know, extremely bored mm -hmm. with the whole thing. And by the time I was in college, having left town, I was pretty much on my own. And I I probably went three times, four times over the course yeah. of a few years. Well, yeah. I mean, going back to your dad real quick, yeah. uh, like I think I mean there's statistics on that, right? I think what what is it if uh, if a mother's the only one that that's Catholic and goes to church. It's only a 33% chance or something like that, that her kids will stay Catholic. Um, if it's the dad, if it's only the dad, it's like 80%. And then if it's the dad and the mom, it's like 86%. So it's really interesting how much, you know, when we're called to be the, the spiritual leaders of our home. Yeah. Like that's backed up by data. I mean that like we see that with the, with those type of numbers. Um the, those could be off slightly. It's been a number of years since I've I've quoted that. No, but, but I think the point is is still there's a dramatic jump between just mm -hmm. the mother and then the father getting involved. Yep. Yeah. Yeah, a hundred percent. And I mean I think it's uh but I think that's that shift you felt, right? Uh that you didn't know it at the time, but I mean it's 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 really interesting when um, I think my kids have felt that since we've been Catholic, because I don't know if I was necessarily leading. Right. I, I think I was just going through the motions uh, <laughs> before. But I mean, now it's like, you know, uh, like I'll, I'll make my boys go to a confession. And my wife's like, do they really need to? I'm like, I don't care. They're going <laughs> like, <laughs> like we're going to give it like I took my oldest yesterday. I was like, nope. I heard him lie about something to, and I was like, yeah, you're going to confession, dude. You haven't been in about three weeks. So Let's you're do going. It. Yep. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> exactly. Yeah. There was something that there was something that happened there. And even if, as you'll hear in my story, even if I ended up messing up royally, there's still something to be said about baptismal grace, the indelible mark of baptism, uh, as well as hindsight. You can look back and say, Oh man, there were some incredible signs along the way yeah. that I should have paid attention to. And now that I recognize that, maybe I can address those with my kids before, before, yeah. before they repeat what their father did. Yeah, that's so. the last thing we want any of our kids to do is to be us in our adolescence. So <laughs> oh my gosh. Yeah. And then you realize, isn't that what isn't that what our parents wanted? so that's where that's where prayer comes in and, yes and yes 100 percent. yeah my yeah. wife and i always talk about that she was crazy in high school and i was crazy in college so i'm like if we can get through high school without anyone being crazy and then get through college without anyone being crazy we have won you have won <laughs> but anyway so so you go through your uh going through high school kind of getting bored and i and i get that and it, so in high school, and I'm just curious with this growing up in California, um, because we're 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 around the same age, I'm guessing. Um there what like my friends at school weren't churchgoers regularly. Yeah. Um, did you experience that too? Like there was yeah, a few. There were, there were a few. So so I had a few buddies that I was confirmed with. I don't remember sitting near them in the pews. I don't know who honestly yeah. I don't remember who was attending but they were, we were all confirmed together. So I have pictures of that. And then aside from that, 
group, that small group, I knew of a few decent friends that mm-hmm. went to a Protestant church, maybe three of them. And that was it. That yeah. was it. No one else discussed it. Yeah. And I think that weighs on you a lot, uh, especially in high school when it's like, man, I'm the only one that's going to church. I'm the only one that's, <laughs> you know, uh, it. it's not that you are questioning. I mean, I guess you are a little bit questioning your faith, but at the same time, uh, you know, I, I would always ex- I would always get in arguments with my atheist friends and we'd have these discussions. Like I had a few uh, Mormon friends and I had a few uh, uh, Jewish friends and a few atheist friends. And, you know, but they, the Mormons obviously were regular churchgoers, but that's a whole other category. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> yeah. But um, yeah, it was definitely weird. Cause I, I always felt it, it was strange because I was the only one I felt that was the, I had one other friend I can really think of that was a regular churchgoer that I knew of. So, and all the kids in my youth group were crazy, which is why my parents wouldn't let me do youth group stuff in high school. So, <laughs> like, I remember you know? there was a, a gentleman that he was probably a year older than me, a Protestant, and he set up this, it was supposed to be a Bible study, after school Bible study. I've never told a soul this, I'm just realizing we get together the first time and within five minutes it becomes just jokes pretty bad jokes yeah and and really odd comments about people and i i don't remember all the details i never went back to it but that was my association (laughs) with bible study when i was probably a junior maybe a sophomore and I think something happened there that also right. messed with me a little bit uh, now that I think about it. But um, I, I definitely carried that through the years where, I don't know, I just, I didn't take it seriously and, and the people around me didn't take it seriously. So we all feed off of each other. Mm-hmm. And so it seemed natural to kind of w- walk away. Yeah. Like I wasn't even upset at the church. I don't remember ever being like in a, I mean, I was rebellious just in general, but I don't remember yeah. saying I'm going to step out because I just don't like the church. It It's because I was only going out of obligation. Yeah. Yeah. Cause your parents went right. Yeah. Yeah. I, and I always say that, uh, yeah. Cause when I finally moved out of the house, I was lucky. I went to a Christian college and we had to go to chapel. And so there is it's not that we didn't party or do anything crazy, but that was always a constant. And I was sure. looking back, I'm grateful because if I had gone to a state school or a regular university, it would have been yep. bad. But okay, so you're out of high school now and you've yep. stopped going. Mm-hmm. Kind of what was happening at that point? Um, college and parties and Fresno State, just, Fre- just yeah. Just a okay. Good, well, yeah, the, I, right. I also went to a JC up in the Bay. Okay. Okay. And in that period, there was heavy, heavy drinking. Mm-hmm. And then in the midst of all that, um, I lost my uncle who was, I actually befriended. I mean, we became really good friends when I was in the Bay and he passed and it was, it was beyond difficult for me. And yeah. so I'd already had, I was already drinking. That just took me into another a, notch. Oh my goodness. Yeah. Yes. And in that period, it was, it was, there's a lot of, it was blurry as I don't even know how to explain it beyond that is as blurry as I can make get it, it, it to be. Yeah, get it to be. exactly. So that carried for, years and 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 at that point i wasn't even i don't know that i was claiming that i was catholic so when i wasn't going to church if people were to ask me and it came up occasionally about religion i would say i'm catholic and that was the end of it right and so i was still at least claiming it and not even knowing anything 
And so if you fast forward a few years out of college, I meet my future spouse. And within two dates, I think she's asking, okay, Catholic, why do you pray to the saints? I mean, she, she had a few okay, really good questions and I had no answers. And so I got really upset, really upset. Like, wow, you're, you're attacking my foundation. And it turns out it wasn't like, what, what is a foundation if you cannot defend the foundation? Mm -hmm. What is this cultural religion idea? Like, it's, it's so similar to a cultural stance where yeah. it's just what you do. But that doesn't speak to a relationship with your creator. It doesn't speak to doing anything like love of neighbor. It doesn't speak to any of those things. It's just, hey, I, I'm just Catholic. So get over it. That kind of thing. Yeah. So she had every right as we are learning about each other to ask questions that she thought were relevant. And she thought, hey, if you're claiming the Catholic faith, you should be able to answer simple questions. I think that's fair. Yeah, yeah I think that's fair. And I think, but I don't think you're in the minority there at all. Yeah. Yeah. You know, I mean, all my friends I had, my best friend growing up was like your buddies. He went to confirmation and that was about it, right? Like he, I know he never went, he went to, I don't even know if they went to mass on Christmas. I know they would always go to mass on Easter. That was it. And uh, knew nothing of his faith at all. And the rest of my my friends that were Catholic or culturally Catholic, yeah, that was my experience with uh, with other Catholics too was, They'd go to confirmation and then that was about it. So yeah. um, I, I, I don't think you're in the minority, which is really sad. I mean, when you're looking at catechesis, uh, uh, especially, you know, our generation, I, I'm hoping it's getting better now. But I, yeah, and, and I think it's getting better. And then to your original point about being a leader, if we have learned how to defend the faith, we need to obviously teach that to the children and not just send them to school and say good luck or put it completely on the teachers yep and that's that's ultimately on us to help them understand and especially i was saying you being a convert now you understand so much that is truly a grace that a lot of people don't see yeah and so we have this obligation to help other people defend the faith and and show them love and all that so it's it's a tremendous grace anyway after she asked those questions and i got angry we never went to a catholic church i think as a result of that but we both we both knew we both knew we were both drawn still to the Christian to Christianity. So she was mm -hmm. raised, she was raised Seventh Day Adventist, uh, and okay. she had kind of distanced herself from the church. I don't know, it was uh, as a teenager at mm -hmm. some point. And so, in a sense, we've both kind of distanced ourselves from what we were brought up in. And we get married, and she turns to me and says, "I think we should find a church." And so we're not going to go to the Adventist church. We're not going to go to the Catholic church. So what are you to do? Well, I've heard this, not the exact story, but similar stories where you just say, what's the nearest church or what's yeah. the word on the street? Like who, who's cool? Right. Who, you know, who's preaching gospel truth? Where are the, where's the Bible believing church, right? <laughs> yep. So we went to a few churches. Uh, one of them was like I say mainline Pentecostal. So there are a lot of variants. Like, yeah, there's a ton of variants in the Pentecostal range. Yeah. And then a Baptist church that was not fundamentalist. So I, I again, a lot of different- It was flavors. the Baptist light. Baptist light, yes. Yeah. And in both experiences at both of those churches, I got uh, just a weird, weird vibe. There are a few conversa conversations that were had. I just wasn't, Again, you have to remember, all I knew was the Catholic faith, okay? Yeah. So I empathize with Protestants that first step into a 
Catholic Church. They're like, what is going on? None of this makes sense because they're comparing it to a, a service that, let's just say, is stripped down, um, to say the least. So they they walk into a Catholic church and it's, what is going on? So I walked into these churches. I had never seen someone lifting their hands and kind of swaying back and forth. Right. With the band right. and the band, forty-five minute sermon. Yeah, and then one, in one of the services, a gentleman got up and he was talking about raising money for a mission trip, and he was up talking for twenty-five minutes about this. It took up a, like half of the service, and I had never, yep. I had never seen anything like. I've that. experienced that a ton. <laughs> yeah. So, yeah. So anyway, we we find a church uh, that was on its way to becoming much bigger. So, mm. you know, the model, I'm sure you've heard of the model. You start in the, some of these start in homes. They graduate to cafeterias and high school, high schools or yep. a gym in a high school. They then fundraise, they get a smaller building. Maybe it's part of a shopping mall and then they're fundraising. It's just constant fundraising. So they can ultimately own get a their own. building. Yeah. Do, do their thing. And so we were part of that process. I end up in that church and the pastor, it was probably the third time we went. My wife had said, can we at least go to this place three times before you bail, basically? <laughs> and by that point, I was getting comfortable with the hand raising. I was comfortable with the way that preaching was happening. And the pastor really amazed me. There were a few sermons. I don't remember what the themes were but they were powerful. And I mm -hmm. said, Oh, Whoa, I've never heard preaching like this in my life. What's going on here. And, and if anyone, if, if you want details, like I wrote a book, I don't know if you knew that Brian, but no, I wrote I didn't. A book. yeah. So I wrote a book and it, it goes into a lot of details. So anything that I skip over, anyone that's interested can read. Yeah. It. Send me the link and I'll, uh, yeah. you, your website too. And I'll put everything down below. Sure. So, so people Appreciate can that. check that out. Um, anyway, I responded to what they call an altar call and felt this was over the period of, I don't know, six months where I'm hearing preaching, I'm getting into the worship service, I'm being vulnerable. And anyway, I end up in front of the stage and I can't call it an altar call. It's not, it's yeah. not an altar, right? Uh, but I end up there and I'm bawling my eyes out and I don't know why. And I'm surrounded by people that are doing the same. My hands are up. I have someone laying hands or several people laying hands on me, praying over me. And I go back to my seat and I'm emotionally like recharged. Mm -hmm. But the other thing I didn't mention is I was struggling not only with alcohol at that time, but pornography. Yeah. And neither of those things went away. I believe that I thought there was a silver bullet in the altar call. Now, no doubt yeah. those tears were real. Like something was missing. <laughs> I was a mess. That uh, proverbial God shape, a God shape hole in your heart. Right? Yes. You know, absolutely. And anyway, I thought it was probably going to be a silver bullet. I still had the same issues. Yeah. This went on for years. I end up rededicating myself, I think is what they called it at one mm -hmm. of the services, another altar call. I end up in front again, hands are laid on me. I think I expressed I was dealing with possibly, I don't, I don't know. Right. Um, I had a lot of shame. Like I didn't want to share what was going on secretly. Fast forward a few years and I'm at this point, my wife and I had been married eight years, I think, seven years. Mm -hmm. eight. And I'm on a walk. I would take these walks daily at this pretty big park. And I'm walking, 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 realizing maybe not in that moment, but weeks prior, my life's still the same. I even got in the baptismal tank. That's the other part of this. It's okay. It's, I didn't recognize one day. No well, I mean, if you're going to a Protestant church and you're baptized as a baby, a lot of them are going to, especially Baptists, if it was like a, a like a bap, yeah, a lot of them don't recognize infant baptism. And so 
they oh. wouldn't have thought about it anyways. So yeah, yeah, that makes sense. And plus the whole born again. Born again. Yeah. They were yeah. saying like, if you have, you were expected to get into the baptismal tank and give some type of testimony mm -hmm. at the time I had, there's no doubt, like God was working on me though. So there's no doubt he was working on me and I don't discount any of that period. Cause I know he's going to use it for good. But in the moment I'm like, yeah, I, I, I've been struggling with alcohol and I, I don't know what else I spoke of, but I certainly was not going to say pornography in right. front of everyone. My wife's family showed up. <laughs> yeah. My wife didn't know, you know, I'm doing, dealing with all this secret stuff. So a few months after the baptism, I'm on that walk and in the most miraculous way, I mean, it didn't seem like a miracle in the moment, but I felt heard in my spirit, the Holy Spirit telling me you will confess to your wife. And that's that moment is where the book starts. Yeah. Because my entire life just was all imploding kind of coming yeah. together and imploding at the same time. At the same time, everything I've ever known, everything came to a stop and I describe it as I'm running now. Like I was walking. Now I'm like, I need to, it's like I was trying to run from the thought of yeah. having to be known, having to come clean. And the rest of that day, I was running from that thought and I was a mess. And by that evening, I, I confessed. Yeah. You know, I've been dealing with pornography for decades. I've yeah. been drinking in secret for a long time, one thing after another. And so for the first time in my wife's life, she was starting to understand who I am. And so that started a process that lasted, I'll just say a long time. Like, yeah, way, I mean, a long, long time. Yeah, I mean, I think we've all, well, I mean, if you've been married long enough and you're trying to be honest and open with your spouse and, you know, I've, I've had that, conf that confession with her too, that I, that I have struggled with porn and lust and stuff. And it's not, it is a awful conversation um, because you feel shame. They feel betrayed. Yep. Um, it just, it rips every, everything apart. And it, I mean, to this day, like there's nothing that I regret more in my life than I don't even know who was the first to introduce me to any of that stuff. And cause it's, it's awful and I do everything I can yeah. to make sure my boys yep. are not exposed to that until they can have the wits to say, Ooh, gross. We, I don't need to look at that. Um, because I was too young to even contemplate that that's bad. And plus all my buddies were into it and it's just like, it's awful. And it just, it, it gets its claws into you and it's a scary thing. It's just, it's absolutely horrific. And you know how you're we talking about you're around friends that are not practicing anything. Yeah. Well, it's easy to just morph into each other, you know, you just merge in, into each other. You're just this cluster of whatever mm -hmm. agnostic beliefs, potentially atheistic beliefs. Well, likewise, people are caught up in alcohol. Well, you're all caught up in alcohol. Yep. Someone's coming up in porn. Hey, check this out in the locker room. Yep. And so then you're all caught up. And that's simply to warn others. It's not to like, I've taken full responsibility. I still had choices to make over those years, full, uh, fully capable, full of, mm -hmm. you know, reason I had my faculties. Yeah. Um, I definitely talk about you've got to warn and you've got to understand that a kid that's put in that position that needs to be acknowledged as well. You know yeah. what I mean? With, without saying like, Oh, I'm not culpable. No, you gotta, you gotta own, own it and let the Lord sanctify you and work through vice and yep. hopefully move forward in a much better way so that you can 
again, empower others to fight yeah. this garbage that it, I can't, I, I am disconnected from what it is now and how accessible it must be. But my goodness, it's got to be. I, I'm even at the point where I get mad when I go to the store and women are wearing leggings. Yep. Hey, like, it drives me nuts. And I'll come home and I'm like, oh, I hate going to Whole Foods. You know, <laughs> like yeah. it just drives me crazy. Like our whole culture is just sexualized and it's all. Well, when you, when you, when you step out of it, like if you're in it, that's just normal life. Yeah. That's just, I don't know how else to say it. it's normal life. Yeah. If you're coming out of that paradigm and I write about that at length in the book, where what the heck i get me out of here what is going on i didn't realize what was projected out there mm -hmm. i didn't see it even though i saw it if you if you yeah hear me, you're numb to it you're numb to it you just go about your day and you know the eyes as uh is it in proverbs yeah Some i think proverbs. it is the eyes yeah. are never the eyes are never satisfied right yep you've got to yeah just got to empower people and and talk about the importance of escaping that garbage so yep yeah so please anyone watching this you got young kids girls too because yep. it's an issue with girls keep them away from it don't let them have uh cell phones or anything too young and if you do monitor the heck out of it or lock them down exactly. um yeah yeah yep. anyways all right so yep. We're uh, um, topic that okay. I'm you also passionate question. about. We <laughs> could, yeah, we could talk for a long time about a number of things that I that I said, but that process, first of all, that addiction, both alcohol and pornography, ended the moment that I confessed to her. That's fantastic. Like cross, I <laughs> by virtue of. God. Uttering that, and then the nausea that came over both of us, <clears throat> nausea that lasted for a long time for both of us. But that those went away, those addictions, right? And so we were working on repairing our marriage. And <clears throat> in a sense, I don't think you can look at it as, okay, well, it's repaired. It's always, it's almost like the church in constant need of reform. Mm -hmm. marriage always needs to be he constantly healed yeah worked on otherwise it ends yep. straight up so we came out of that and um thanks be to god we have a beautiful relationship and it took years and years of hard work and again it's not lost on either of us that you keep that up you keep working on it about 18 months into that process um we were still going to which was what was now a mega church okay mm -hmm. um super active they were expanding left and right and there was a guest speaker they came up on stage one week and was talking about um the people that are in the audience that are not healed. So my wife has rheumatoid arthritis and this guest speaker said, you're not healed. All of you, if you, if, if you don't have, how do I put it? She said, you do not have enough faith if you're walking around and you, oh, are it's healed. that point of view. Yes. And it crushed my wife and it contradicted what our pastor had said the week before. In other words, his message was the Lord permits what he permits, which I, I mean, that's, that's Catholic teaching, that's Catholic teaching. Yeah. He will permit it. You don't try to question it. You don't say, Oh, this suffering should only be as long as I'm working on my faith. It's um, what you see in scripture when Christ would accompany. So he would do the spiritual healing and it would be accompanied with the physical healing that was showcasing his authority. Yeah. Okay. In no way 
does scripture say that those two things have to happen together and that if you suffer physically, and in fact, look at the consistent witness of the saints, okay? There's nothing that says that those things happen together. You can be spiritually healed and have a tremendous physical cross. But yeah. at the time I was in, so ignorant, she had to tell me that was weird. And yeah. so she had enough concern in her voice probably shed some tears over it. I don't remember, but I probably within a day started researching where does this type of healing theology come from? Where does this denomination come from? Mm -hmm. What is non-denominational? <clears throat> I don't know. I'm having trouble speaking. Non-denominationalism. Where does that come from? There's got to be a theology behind that. Right. At the heart of every non-denominational church, there's a statement of faith. Okay. Right. What does that statement of faith connect to? What's the soteriology behind this? Like truly, who goes to heaven? Who goes to hell? Why do you believe it? Where did it come from? Who ushered in that theology? And I'm going up, up, going through time, back in time, figuring out where churches were splitting from each other. Yep. And I started to get overwhelmed, but I kept going, kept going, kept going. And I finally got to the Reformation. And I describe it as a very much a wall. Reformation wall is what I refer to it as. In that I couldn't see my upbringing. I couldn't see orthodoxy. I couldn't see any early church. I couldn't see anything. I could only see that my options were Luther going forward. So in other words... Maybe we should be Calvinist. Maybe we should be Baptist. Right. Maybe we should be Lutheran, et cetera. Uh, were you going to say something? I'm sorry. Well, I was thinking of the roots of that. I think that theology of, you know, the uh, prosperity gospel type stuff, that good things will happen to you if you have strong enough faith. That was definitely like it came in a, to America starting really with the Puritans, that they felt that if their faith was strong enough, then God would bless them. Yeah. Um, and that was kind of that Puritan uh, theology started there in the Northeast and then kind of disseminated throughout all of Protestantism. Well, not all, but a lot. A lot of it. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I'm noticing that a lot of the mainline denominations have split enough to where there's like this other layer of churches that are all saying similar things. They're claiming the mainline Genesis. They're claiming the, the, you know, whether it's Baptist or Lutheran or, or Calvinist reformed, but their theology is starting to like meld together. So they're yep. clinging to certain tenets of the mainline faith, but then they're playing ball on this similar to what you were just saying, kind of that prosperity realm starts yep. to cover all of those, those churches. So it's really interesting. Um, what was I saying? Uh, you had gotten to Luther and it was like the wall and you were thinking yes. about being Calvinist or Baptist or Lutheran. Yes. Yes. So I, and the reason I say that is because YouTube, as it's still very prominent these days, I could look up anything. I could just type in, um, Calvinist preacher. And so I started finding John MacArthur videos, Paul mm -hmm. Walker videos, RC Sproul videos, um, you name the preacher that, you know, they would just, the videos would keep popping up. I would start reading Spurgeon. I'd start reading. Uh, there was a few Baptist pastors. I'm like, oh man, that is an incredible sermon. My yeah. They can give some good sermons. I, 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 you guys are hitting it hard. You can't and, throw too much shade on the, on the preaching ability of some of these uh, Baptist no, pastors. They're amazing. <laughs> no. And there's something to be said about some of those sermons are, helping the very people that are the people that I interview and we'll get into this. Yeah. They were listening to those same videos and those videos spoke to them in a way, but it also propelled them to continue exploring. And that's how they end up Catholic. Yeah. So it's certainly not all bad. Um, anyway, I, I just looked at my wife and I said, I, I don't even know what to do. And we stopped going to church. That was the other thing after that, guest speaker was talking about faith and healing we we dropped out 
we dropped out and we were out for a few months. And anyway, I'm sick one night, so sick, had the flu and I couldn't sleep. And I get up to go to the bathroom. I feel like I'm going to throw up. So I'm leaning over the toilet. And in that moment, I'm feeling a similar feeling that I felt at that park years earlier. And I start bawling, like as much as I've ever bawled in my life. And I heard the Holy Spirit say, you got to research. It was something like you got to research the Catholic faith or research your upbringing. I don't, it was something like that. Yeah. And I went back to sleep crying, not knowing what the heck that's, that's what it was. I was crying out to him. What do you want me to do? We had already gone on this wild ride. My wife and I like yeah. wild ride. And we were just numb and nauseous and like, where do we go? There's gotta be a way. And so I was crying out to him and I, yeah, I felt that response. And by that next day, um, I've told a lot of people this, that wall that I had, it crumbled yeah lawn boom like everything started just flashing i immediately thought about the early church and like whoa i've been thinking about i've been thinking in terms of theology that started in 15 18 yeah yeah i've been in that paradigm even though i was raised catholic so i could finally see all of that, not all at once, but I could, I could understand that there is so much to dig into. So I just went crazy. Apologetics left and right, reading documents, reading books, basically spanning hundreds of years. 1500 years there, church history. Yeah. Yes. And here's the interesting thing in those early church writings, documents, I'm like, what, what am I learning here? There's no complete, complete canon at this point in these early centuries. And I was hearing Sola Scriptura. I'm reading documents that are so clearly discussing the Eucharist, mm-hmm. that are so clearly connected to John 6, that are so clearly talking about the liturgy and talking about infant baptism and left and I mean just so much. And so when I'd have objections, I'd still have little objections. Like, yeah, maybe I'm not meant to be Catholic. I'd look it up with an open, just completely open to what I'm gonna find. And I mean, the paradigm had shifted. So yeah, I could tell when someone was mocking the church and they didn't have anything to back it up. They were referencing verses just saying, as you can clearly see. I'm like, based on based on whose interpretation? Who's interpretation. So when I got to that point, I realized, and I talk about this in my uh, testimony video, at that point, it's just a matter of what glasses you're going to wear. And, yeah. And, and who manufactured the glasses. Oh, so 100%. Yeah. Who, who you got to trace that supply chain. Who put those glasses together to help you see that verse? Because people will come on your channel, my channel, any Catholic's channel and say, that's not what that verse means. And so then people will jump in and and comment and say, actually, I can cite things throughout the witness of the church that talk about this specific teaching. Meanwhile, you can consistently reference something that's, in isolation, 1820s. <laughs> it has no relation to development. Yeah. And then I saw that people were claiming, like, this guy's a heretic or this guy's a heretic, but they had no councils. They had no, <laughs> they had right. no consistency of authority to be able to say that. And I also realized that people were borrowing the very things that they, you know, they were borrowing things from the Catholics that they loved. But then if the Catholic Church, if people under that roof made mistakes, it invalidated the, the entire church. church said, yeah. That is odd because if you're sola scriptura and you're able to interpret it, when you sin and you make a mistake, you're invalidated. Right. Like 
what I noticed was there was no apples to apples. And when one once you did apples to apples, there was only one church left. Yeah. And sorry, I'm talking a lot, man. No, you're good. I'm I'm falling like all I keep thinking is, man, yeah. this is you're like describing my experience there on that six, seven months of me diving in doing the same thing where it's like, oh my gosh, I was never taught this. They were talking about this in the 150s. Like the yeah. um was it no it wasn't polycarp who was it in the 150 that justin wrote this martyr. yeah justin martyr that wrote about the mass the order of the mass you and can't. you got saint ignatius of antioch writing about the eucharist you have first clement in the 70 a.d writing about um church authority and and i if i remember right i think that letter also talks about uh, apostolic secession and how the the apostles were worried about it like i mean it's just crazy when you start reading all this and you're like this nothing i'm reading here fits anything that i'm finding in any protestant church that i can go to right now well the other thing is like um certain groups will claim augustine certain protestant groups will kind of claim certain writings of augustine yeah. if you read augustine refuting the donatists for example mm -hmm. it's so catholic He's describing the importance of the succession, uh, apostolic succession. He's addressing the importance of the bishop. He's addressing every aspect that we talk about so clearly in order to ensure that there is unity of faith and to be able to say someone is out of bounds. It is objectively true because yeah. we have a succession that traces to christ and so he was talking about these rogue bishops that did not have that succession and if you lose that line that thread you, I mean, you're done you're outside you're done and you're not going to call a council you don't have the authority you and a lot of these people like the Donatists, they would cite the fact that there were people that were not perfectly pure. So they thought of the Holy Church. That means that all clergy should be perfect. Otherwise, the sacraments are, are invalid. No, they're invalid. Yeah. They're invalid. And so I, I realized, oh, my gosh, you see it to this day. Like yep. people are expecting the perfection of clergy as if the administrant is going to it, that's the efficacy de depends on the their, state their holiness um, and completely missing the point that the administration of the sacraments is based off christ it's not based off our holiness we would never have sacraments if it was we based couldn't have, us. we couldn't have sacraments yeah anyway eucharist went me yeah anyways okay sorry Anyway, I'll, 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 I'll button it up here. So I end up bringing this to, up to my wife, what I'm learning. I'm on fire. Like, oh my goodness, how did I miss this? My dad was telling me about it. I just completely, I'm so ignorant, but I'm seeing it and God's working on me. And of course she's like, what the heck? You were talking about Bapt a Baptist church. Now you're talking about the Catholic church. And it was not good. Yeah, I mean, we kind of, we had our, our, um, our our moments for sure. Yeah. It got her to a point where she said, you know what? I'm going to go research this stuff. We'll see. We'll see. Um, and that took some time, but we, uh, she joined our CIA. Mm -hmm. We had our marriage convalidated and our children were baptized. And it was just a miracle from top to bottom. Yeah. I mean, that's, that's fantastic and, and that's obviously a story of christ and the holy spirit working through you throughout your entire life and i and i think that's it's a perfect example of how god never gives up on us yes we give up on ourselves way faster than he gives up on us so true you know and um and i and i love uh he's always he's always seeking us and even when we don't think we're seeking him or he's not talking to us because things are going bad and you know what 
name it right and uh we're mad at god or i'm not going to church anymore because i you know x y y z and um but he's always there and he's always whispering to us and sometimes it's a lot louder and then sometimes it's a gentle nudge you know like um uh, yeah that just reminds me so much of just when i think anyone can look through their life and see moments where you go that was god even my bad decision god made it good like the th like I, I can even think of things uh that led me to meet my wife that were not good decisions but then i met her and yeah. then you know like now we're on this trajectory and we're catholic and and i think that's a beautiful testimony of just the holy spirit constantly working on us even when we're giving up on it and you, ourselves yeah absolutely and the other thing is working through those protestant days right so clearly so even when i was we were going to this church i wasn't i still wasn't close to god i mean some of the time i was getting closer to mm -hmm. the best of my ability still shut all of my sins down but i remember i was on a drive by myself pretty much in the middle of nowhere i was heading out to a family member's memorial like a, an extended family member's memorial and i'm out on this road there's no one out there i'm listening to um christian metal theocracy i don't know okay, if yeah. Know. yeah i've heard of them yeah some of the best christian <laughs> metal i've ever heard and there's this uh, song called I Am, and just the lyrics are unbelievable. And I was already on the verge of tears just because I, I don't even know what I was. Again, I think God was I love those me. solo car rides. I oh, my gosh, man. I think, guy, I think men like solo car rides more than anything else. I don't, you know, like we could be in our own thoughts, listen, you know. Yeah. Anyway, yep. yeah. Anyway, this song is epic. It's like a nine minute progressive metal song anyway uh i'm getting into it and i'm feeling a void like and he has this lyric something about not seeing jesus like where are you something like that or he's everywhere maybe it was another song i'm getting lost in it whatever the case is i'm like where are you god at that moment a car is driving by 60 miles an hour Jesus is Lord is painted on the hood of this car. And I just burst into tears. And similar to the altar calls, yeah, I burst into tears. Did I change? No, but the point is something was happening that he, you know, he's like he's knocking, like, where are you, Lord? Jesus is Lord. Car drives by. I've never seen anyone with Jesus is Lord painted on their hood. On their car hood, yeah. <laughs> crazy that that is fantastic and I, I think uh props to you and your wife for sticking that out and being so committed through all all of that struggle and even the for her to sit down and go and, and i get it being seventh day Ad advents growing up that way um they're not exactly catholic friendly to be like okay you're obviously serious about this yeah i, I fine I'll, I'll look into it too Oh, um, mad respect yeah. for the entire thing, uh, like saint, like what she, what she went through, and yeah, and for her to say, I'm willing to even, even look, even to prove someone wrong, like you could just be so closed off that you say, I'm not even gonna look at this thing. Yeah, yeah, hundred percent. Yeah, and, I think that's fantastic. So that was awesome, and so I want to switch now, though, and kind of start talking about um common themes that you have seen uh just talking with with so many people about their conversion story yeah and what are the three to five or whatever like we can kind of get into how, however many yeah. we have time for here yeah um about what's drawing people to the catholic church and i think this is important for us as catholics to understand these themes because it's different for everybody and I think we're used to talking about our faith, right? Like, I mean, we do it all the time. Yeah. 
and I have like I was at the symphony uh, Saturday night with my son and sat next to this lady. And within 10 minutes, we're talking about the, the Catholic faith. And I don't even know how it got there. And awesome. she she was totally interested. We we're having this great conversation about uh, infallibility. And then the symphony started. So we had to stop talking. And so afterwards, I was like, I do have a YouTube channel if you want to you know, learn more. And, you know, you can reach out to me through that, too, if you want to talk more. Yeah. Um, but not a lot of people are used to that. So I think it's good for us um, to know, to kind of think about like, well, what, why are people drawn? Like what, yeah. what's causing it? So let, let's kind of dive into that a little bit. Um, what's causing it. There's something I've noticed the theme where there are a lot of people that are super anti-Catholic and they're so anti-catholic they can never they they could not imagine exploring the faith and then what happens is it's either a person that god sends their way or there's some type of emergency that comes up or they feel in the oddest way drawn to research mm -hmm. it's almost like they it's the last thing they would ever do but the Holy Spirit is guiding them to investigate. It it's really odd. Okay. Yeah. And the number of people that will say, you've got to know that I'm being truthful here because it's the last thing I wanted to do, but I will not ultimately deny, yeah. de deny the Holy Spirit. And for those naysayers, they're like, what did I have to gain? Like you have to understand from a material perspective, right? Yeah. I'm going to lose family members. In many cases, I'm going to lose money as a result. I'm going to have issues with work. I'm going to have issues here, there, everywhere. I'm going to feel rejected, etc. But to gain Christ, they realize that's that's everything it's worth it and it's completely worth it and if and they want to say if you guys only knew and i think they communicate that in the testimonies but mm -hmm. there's a part of a lot of them that want to kind of cry out if you guys only knew then we could like hold hands and yeah. join like so that's why i'm i'm working on this with the comments that i get on a daily basis rabid anti-catholic comments to realize that that very person that could be writing at that moment in a year could be an RCIA. We have uh, no yeah. reason to say their heart is too hard. It's, it's over too far yeah. gone. That's ridiculous. Cause then that would negate, that would basically elevate us. Oh, we're Jesus special. Christ. We were called to do something. We were called to defend. What if the people that are so against the church and when I, again, I've seen it. I've, interview people that were so against the church and then something shifted and now they're defending the church against the very p and they'll t and that's what's so beautiful about it they'll tell the other groups that are anti-catholic they'll say i was in your shoes let me tell you <laughs> what i went through yeah come alongside it's that it's that approach so that's yeah. one dramatic thing i don't know if there's it's it kind of mixes with other no I, I agree because i think uh, i i had this thought um who was it i was talking with it, you know i i was talking with actually i was communicating back and forth with another youtuber that hadn't posted in a while and i was just checking on her to see what was going on and the negative uh, comments were getting to her and um i've been germinating this with the difference between somebody that's asking genuine questions because they're curious yeah. um, versus the, I am not ready to hear this. Yeah. Um, and the interact, like, cause I think those that, I think you're exactly right. Cause God can do, I mean, look at Saul, you know, <laughs> he was killing Christians. Yeah. And God goes, bam, knocks him upside the head. And the next time he's written most of the new Testament and has spread the gospel across the world um it's anything is possible and so even those people that are are having negative comments 
Um, I don't typically engage because I don't want to do the comment argument stuff no, in those. It's nowhere. But I look yeah. at them and go, I'm going to pray for you. I, I, I need to say a prayer for this person. And I, I'm, honestly, I don't always do that, but I need to to do that more often because the Holy Spirit works in amazing ways. It's it's a mystery and you never know. And I think a lot of those people, it is a either a shattering of a core belief like one, it can be a crack. Yeah. That's all it has to be. And for me, it was, it, the crack was the, the Apocrypha being taken out in the 1800s. Yep. For the Protestant Bibles. That's a crack. They're like different. I, exactly. You know, yeah. and it was like, wait a second. I don't like that. And, um, and so, but it could be a number of other things. And I, and I think, uh, that yeah, I, I agree with you completely. I think a lot of those that go on that far anti-Catholic side, um, it's typically something they either have a complete paradigm shift or something traumatic happens to them, and they see. And it's like you were saying, glasses, right? Like they're all of a sudden the the scales are lifted off their eyes, and they're like, "Wait a second, yeah did i did I just agree with that priest on Mary, <laughs> you know, or something, something. like that?" Something like that. Yeah. And the other thing I've noticed is for Catholics that get so upset, they're then attacking their upbringing. And it's a theme. I don't know where they end up going to church, but then they have a new theology and it's the complete opposite of the Catholic church's yep. theology. So then they have a litany of verses that they're going to throw at you. Um, which is, yeah, just another reason to pray is what is what I'm trying to say. Yep. Like you're, you're going to see it from every angle. You're going to get it from every angle. You're going to get it even within the church. Yeah. And that hurts. That hurts. And so I think the prayers just need to be ramped up because again, you're seeing all this beauty, all the people that are coming in, but then you see a bunch of resistance, spiritual warfare gets amped up. Yep. We got to get on our knees and pray constantly. That, and, and that's, I'm speaking to myself when I, when I say Yeah, that. same here. I, I need to do it more. Yeah, I mean, I, I need to. Yeah, I, anyone watching this, uh, definitely let's say a few Hail Marys for those people yep. that are anti-Catholic and yep. let the Holy Spirit just overwhelm them. Yep, 100%. exactly. Exactly. Okay, so the other thing I wanted to mention is, shoot, I've been doing this, yeah, three years. Um, it's come up a lot that Mary was a hurdle, almost the final hurdle. Mm-hmm. So you'll hear about papacy being the final hurdle, just authority in general. Yep. Mary, and then maybe something like confession, like why, why, why the priesthood, that kind of thing, right? Mm -hmm. um, but the people that mention Mary more often than not, she becomes such a powerful guide for them to lead them to Christ in a deeper relationship, and then they defend her. They're like the mother of God. Yeah. And let me tell you about her. You don't need to be afraid. <laughs> let me teach you about what intercession means. Right. Let me teach you about perpetual virginity. Let me teach you about the, uh, the immaculate conception. And what I'm trying to say is those that have that barrier, they become apologists for Mar yeah. for Marian teachings. Big Yet time. again, God flipping, just allowing that difficulty to form them, to kind of refine them. And then they're able to go to battle. Yeah. And defend. So, yeah. Yeah. I think it, it, cause Mary, she wasn't necessarily, she was probably the last thing out. I, I, I wasn't, you know, if you're good with the church authority for my thought was, okay, I'm cool with church authority. I haven't figured Mary out, so I'll figure that out later. Like, I know I have to do, like, I have to consent to all this, but I'll, I'll figure that out later. And it did click. Yeah. Um, but it wasn't a, 
it, I didn't have a massive barrier there. But yeah. you do see that depending on what somebody's biggest gripe was. And for me, it was it was probably church authority. And so one like the verses that automatically pop in my head is always going to be um, like Matthew 16, Isaiah 22, 22, uh, yeah. Acts, uh, that Acts chapter two, when they're in the upper room and they and he mentions 120 uh, oh, members in there, which yes. You know, like all these, it's all these church authority or church structure, church authority verses are the first verses that pop in my head. Yeah. Um, because that was my biggest hurdle was authority, um, especially growing up in, in the denomination I did. That's huge. Um, and, and understand the importance of um, typology for a lot of people. I do have to mention that. Like yeah. recognizing that you, you the proof texting gets old and so people want to dig deeper mm -hmm. and start to see all the connections and then they say okay first of all my mind is blown like new eve i mean yeah you know about just new eve i mean even man even in luke the fact that she after mary is pregnant goes to the hill country of judea for yeah. three months like the ark did oh my and, god you know like all of that is just so insane like and when i learned that my mind just like exploded david, david leapt the only leapt time that said how, how, did, how did the ark david of my exactly. lord come to me? me how did the and mother of my leapt. lord come to me oh lord it, it's it's beautiful it's un well it's undeniable once you see that and you can't unsee it and then i tell people like once you have that typology down, now you now then just focus on New Testament, okay? And you've heard everything, the case for Mary interceding, the case of her being Theotokos, mm -hmm. all the things that I just mentioned. And then you look at, well, she's not very present. She's not very present in the New Testament. What are the do you know the last words that she speaks in the New Testament? No. Wedding at Cana, do whatever. Oh, do whatever he tells you. Yeah. Yeah. And I say that that just summarizes what, as Catholics, we're saying. <laughs> but if you don't have that shift, you're like, whoa, who is this figure? It's just it's just a woman. <laughs> right. <laughs> you know? and, well, and they say, like, they say she's not present. But how many verses is it's like Mary was there? True. Like, she's mentioned in the background. So she was there all the time. And even in the upper room, they talk about it, uh, they, the, the 12 were there, uh, including Mary. Like there's, she's always around. And, um, and even, uh, was that Revelations chapter 11 with the, 12. the woman, 12, yeah, 12 with the, with the crown, a woman coming down with the crown with the giving birth to the Lamb of God. It's like, okay, like, I don't know how much more clear. You can get on that. Um, but yeah, typology, I think, man, that, that's a game changer when you're talking, understanding the Bible and Catholic theology. Because there's a little typology done in Protestantism and Bible study, but not, I I, I was on, I was on Gary uh, Machuda's radio show. I can't remember when this, and, when this happened. On apologetics. Yeah, I was, I, I was, I was lucky enough to be a return re recurring guest on his show for about two years. Yeah. And one of his, one time we were, we were talking about just Protestant theology and cause he's fascinated with church of Christ because he's like, they get a lot of things right, but they just use the Bible. Like how the heck did they do that? But they also get a lot of things wrong. And, and I told him, I was like, look, they've been around since the 1830s. They're really young in their theology. Sure. Like they, they haven't, they don't have 15 or 2000 years worth of deep spiritual study on biblical text. Cause if you're going to throw everything out with the, the baby with the bathwater and start scratch from scratch, yeah. you don't have a lot to build on. Yeah. And, um, and I think a lot of Protestant theology, cause they really, like you said, they don't go past that wall a lot of times. And, it, and and then they'll choice quote certain saints that are like, oh, he was the first Baptist, you know, or something like that. Um, 
but man, if you get into typology and you can clearly explain the typology and the, you know, the, the, what is it that he says all the time? The old is hidden in the new and the, and the new is hidden, uh, revealed in the, or the, it's Scott Hahn says this all the time. The, um, yeah, I know exactly what you're saying. The, I'll, I'll watch it as well. Um, the, the new is hidden in the old and the old is revealed in the new. That's what he there said. There you go. Um, Cause it's true. Yeah. And it's such, it's uh, you, when you read, when you read it in the entire Bible, it's like, man. And again, you can't unsee that once you have that yeah. pattern, which makes so much logical sense. Yes. Old covenant, new covenant there. You, you don't just treat them as separate things. How could you? How, you, so, know, how could you? Yeah. One thing, and I'm sure you've noticed this, and this was an appeal to me too. And I'm just wondering how much you've seen this because I feel like I've I've noticed this a lot. A lot of Protestantism is more about feelings, and um, uh, it's not not that they're. Please, if you're Protestants watching this, don't think that I I don't think that you guys are using logic and thinking through things. But I think the basis of a lot, especially non-denominational Bible church, it's all about feeling good, right? Like, oh, that was that music was so good today. That sermon was amazing. It made me feel amazing. But the Catholic church and the Catholic teaching, what was a big appeal to me was the use of logic in your brain, that you're called to do that. You're called to logically think through things and and really dive deep into that and have you noticed that trend also where um where people are drawn more more to catholicism the more they research it because oh my gosh this is like triggering my brain and then the spiritual yes. side kick, kicks in great point i think you know, all through the holy spirit they simply ask questions and then they say well yeah what you're saying kind of logically well that that made sense. I wonder if this other avenue is going to make sense. Mm -hmm. Okay, that makes sense. If I'm going to be intellectually honest, I need to open that other door. Yeah. And then the other door. And then a lot of people will admit, okay, I've opened too many doors. I'm turning back. This is this is too much, too much. And, they, and then they recognize it's dissonance and they need to um, humble themselves because it's a brutal awakening yes in, in in the scariest and most beautiful way at the same time for so many people they're saying how can this be and at the same time if this is true <laughs> if this is true this is everything that i've been yearning for yeah there's no one on earth that could have convinced me that i was going to find it in the catholic faith but then the holy spirit did what only the Holy Spirit can do. I thought I had one more point about that. Oh, the other thing that comes up is the draw of the Holy Eucharist. Mm -hmm. So people are opposed to that thought, to that theology, to transubstantiation. Um, but it's this weird curiosity, just like I was right. saying earlier, like you're so opposed to it, you're also curious about it. And uh-oh, you just looked at a Catholic source instead of just your standard Protestant uh, source. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Um, that's a huge deal. If you make the decision to look at a Catholic source and actually try to understand their position, because I would say that to anyone, you want to engage with a Catholic, and I would say it's the same to Catholics. Get the Protestant position right Try your best not to generalize. Try to get into the head of that person. Like if they are a mainline Baptist, try to understand their theology. Go to the source. Yep. You want to engage. You need to understand what you're talking about. Related to, to the Eucharist, the, and I just released this video recently. This convert has been receiving the Eucharist now for a year and a half, and he cries every Sunday. Yeah, I saw that video pop up. Yeah, I haven't watched it yet, but I'm going to. Yeah. And and I've heard people, I heard, okay, there was a convert. His wife was so against his conversion. 
he convinced her, we're going to go to Europe. We're going to go to Basilica, St. Peter's Basilica. They walk through the doors and she starts bawling her eyes out and decides, I don't know if it was instantly, but she decided, I, okay, I'm going to become Catholic. Yeah. I heard another story. Spouses. They go in. There's a person that just wrote to me about something very similar. They go into a church. One of them wants to be there. One does not. The one that does not want to be there starts bawling when they walk into the church. And they're like, what? I thought this was the whore of Babylon. Why? Right. Why do I feel a peace I've never felt in my entire life? And then they intro, they're introspective. They're like, how could it be, Lord? And then they realize they said they wanted truth. They said they wanted to surrender. It's unbelievable. I'm telling you, man, it's unbelievable what God is doing. So, yeah. And I can attest to that feeling too. The first time um, I went to a Catholic mass when I was thinking of converting. And I, I can't remember if I dove into this when I was, uh, when, when I, when you interviewed me, but because I had an experience at an Anglican church that was, yes. Or, okay. I did dive into that. I, it's, yeah. there's so many, you know, like when you're telling your story, there's so many different actually points and sometimes you bring it up. Sometimes you don't. Yeah. So I was really worried that I was going to have that same just visceral reaction to going into a Catholic church. Um, and the peace I felt sitting on the back pew on a Saturday evening mass, I I had never experienced that before in a church before, you know, and mass was going on. It's not like, you know, there, there's music, there's, you know, everyone doing the responses. It wasn't, you know, it, it was mass, but it was so tranquil and I'd never felt that much peace before in a church building ever. Uh, my entire life and uh that's that was really the confirmation i needed and, and now being catholic and understanding it i was like yeah i'm in the presence of god the eucharist is right there of course i felt peace you know and uh and it's and i think that's the hardest thing when you're converting when you're like man i just want the Eucharist. and you have to wait and wait and wait and wait um yeah, I mean the Eucharist is powerful. And I think uh I think as Catholics we kind of take it for granted. Um and you know, like yeah, I, I think we need I, I'm loving that the bishops are trying to do a revival of, of the Eucharist. Um, but that has to start with us. I think that has to start with the laity. That's great that the bishops have said that, but we as laity need to be showing our, our respect to the Eucharist and that, and it, sh and it shows to other people, they see that. Um, and I, I think it's great. Like, uh, you, you know, um, it's one of the most, I'm so grateful to take it every time I go to mass. It, it's just amazing. So yeah, I, I agree. But I wanted to go back on that point. You said about understanding, uh, the theology of which denomination you're talking to. Um, cause a lot of times when I'm, doing like my solo videos, I'll be very general because there's sure. so many. Oh, but if you're talking one on one to someone, it's really important to be to ask questions about why they believe what they believe and yeah. dive into that because you have to understand their viewpoint if you're going to have a conversation and and to I don't want to say attack. Um, that's not the right word. Um, to figure out what's going to make sense to them because everybody has, especially there's so many different belief systems and denominations out there, but they all have a different angle and you have to understand that angle to, to be able to speak to them in a clear manner to get them well, to understand things. And you got to find some type of common denominator. Common ground. If I just go in and say, Hey, let's go to the book of Maccabees. Uh, let me convince you of, of, right. Let me convince you of purgatory, for example. Right. Right. Why don't you start in First Corinthians or something? What are you doing? Right, right. Well, let's look at the Book of Wisdom. Oh wait, you don't have that. Oh wait, <laughs> yeah, not smart. You know. Um, anyway, yeah, I, I'd say those those what what we covered. Those are the main things that I've noticed. There are many other themes that are running throughout, but those are big. 
those are big things. Yeah. And I think, uh, like even your story and, and mine, it's like something crumbles. Like there's, there's, there's typically a breaking point of something yeah. that it pulls you in. And, and then when it starts pulling and you try to ignore it, it's painful. Uh, you know, like I, I <laughs> when, when you're talking about you, you're asking for truth, uh, you don't know what the Lord's going to do. And, uh, and sometimes it's going to be something like joining the Catholic church, which you don't want to do. Uh, hopefully most of the time that's what it is, but, uh, it's, it can be painful. And I, I actually, I had this, um, I'm looking, thinking about creating a, a t-shirt, um, I think it's, what is it? Matthew 13, but it's, uh, it's Christ said, uh, I didn't come to bring peace, but a sword. Oh yeah. And that like, uh, fathers will be against sons, daughters against mothers. And I think for a convert, like, man, that verse speaks to me because of all you lose the, the strife that you get within families and friends and, like I've I lo I've lost friends because of becoming Catholic. There's definitely a chasm with on my side of the family with being Catholic, um, and so when you're listening to people that are converts, a lot of times they have given up a lot to follow Christ, um, and and it's it's really difficult. And I think as Catholics, we need to be as nurturing and caring for those people that we can. And anyone in your RCIA that's going through it right now, if you're involved in that or, uh, and you feel a call to just be a buddy, that's all I'm talking about, right? Like you don't have to do anything great, but man, those people might've lost all of their friends. Pretty much everything. They might've lost their family. I have to give a shout out to um, the Coming Home Network because they have a ministry dedicated to helping pastors that are trying to figure out how the heck am I going to navigate this? I know yeah. the Catholic faith is true, but I will lose everything, including in some instances, a marriage. Yep. So yeah. it's, it's, it's as real as you just described it. It's so challenging for so many people. So I agree with you. Yeah. We need to be considerate of of them for sure yep 100 percent. well eddie we've we've been uh talking here for a while i'm glad we we ran long we were trying to shoot for an hour y'all we went a little bit long and i'm oh, totally okay with that that i thoroughly enjoyed this conversation same here um and we'll have to do we'll have to get together and do something else again either on your channel or mine either way for sure. Yeah. um for sure so i really appreciate it Everybody, I'm going to have links to his channel, his website, his book, everything down in the in the description below. So please go and check that out. Uh, go check out Catholic Recon. Um, fantastic channel. Uh, I, I love the the stories that, that you have on there and the interviews you've been doing. And uh, praise God that your channel is growing and, uh, and just helping people. And so thank you for coming on. And everybody, please like, share, and subscribe. And we'll talk to you all later.